I heard that some of you have uh, questions about uh, this. Okay. I have two simple questions about the definition of uh, variables. What is the R mass and R B? What is the difference between the two? Ah, so R B is, remember that we're in angular momentum coordinates. And so the radius is actually a dependent variable. And I'm using the subscript B to note the radius that the angular momentum surface has when it intersects the top of the boundary layer. So that's RB. R max is the value of RB on that angular momentum surface in which has the maximum wind speed and radius. So it means it's not the same, but sometimes R max Inside of the R B, it means uh, uh, so R max uh, does not exist as the R B. Yeah. So no. So R B is. Um, I think we maybe I should draw a picture here. So um, here is radius. Here is uh, altitude, and here is an angular momentum surface. And so, remember, this is our independent variable. So RB is defined as the radius at the top of the boundary layer. So each angular momentum surface has a different value of RB. So RB is a function of angular momentum. So RB equals RB of n. Okay? Sorry, what's that? It's supposed to be n. R max is equal to R it's defined to be I'll oh, forget about that. R max or R M is defined to be R B at M max. Where M max is the angular momentum surface that contains the maximum wind speed. Okay? So that's the definition. Our second one is in that figure. Yeah. Is that RB? That's that is if we draw contours of as mutual wind speed. As it equals zero. Okay. If this one is zero, mm -hmm. then this one is RT. So RT is also a function of that. Okay. okay. Yeah. It's so uh, yeah. I remember the uh, the. Is a picture. You show the other relationship between the R T and R N. Uh, the R T uh, square equal R N square uh, C over C K and our uh, Anderson number. Yes. If the C over C K equal one and the uh, number less than one, yes. it means uh, R T is less than R. That's right. So yeah. that's it, unphysical. <laughs> a bit of yeah. strange a feeling. Uh, because uh, it, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That will it will not work in that case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to have, to have R T greater than R C. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't turn it on. Yeah. Yeah. Questions. <laughs> So I want to come to the last topic of the three that I'm going to talk about this time around. Um, and it's going from the idealized world to the practical world. And it's a subject that I have come to feel fairly strongly about. And that is that we scientists who work on tropical cyclones, a lot of us already are helping society by contributing to the development of 
forecast models and the development of forecasting techniques, which I think is very good. But I think we also have an obligation, um, or at least I feel we have an obligation to think about um, how we can help society by helping them assess the long-term risk from natural hazards like tropical cyclones. So take a practical matter if you wish to build a storm barrier across the entrance to the uh, body of water to the south of Japan to prevent, to present, to uh, protect, say, Osaka from storm surge, uh, how high should that barrier be? The higher you make it, the more expensive it is. And to answer that question, politicians or officials need to know what's the strongest storm you can reasonably expect, let's say, over 100 years. Now, um, it's very difficult for us to do this, but I think it's increasingly possible. And that's true whether or not we think the climate's changing. And let me try to persuade you that we need to, or it would be very beneficial to society if more of us got involved in this. So, first of all, what is the risk? So, the hurricane risks are, you know, is wind, okay, causes structural damage to buildings. Uh, rain, um, and this is usually downplayed in many places, but I suspect in Japan, and I know in many parts of the U.S., this is a numerically greater hazard than wind. More damage is typically caused by rain, more lives are lost because of fresh water flooding. And then we have storm surge, which is related to wind, all right? Now, one thing you ought to understand about storm surges, and probably you do understand this, but I often run into people who don't, it's physically the same phenomenon as a tsunami. It's the same hydrodynamics, except that it's powered by wind rather than shaking seafloor. And um, people don't understand how dangerous a storm surge is. You may. And so when I give talks to the public, I always show this amateur video of a real storm surge that took place in uh, Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. So I want you to watch this video. This is in the middle of a typhoon. Okay, that's a storm surge. And if you watch that film, you know you can't survive that. Okay, in fact, the fellow who took this film was extremely lucky to survive this event, all right? Um, you cannot survive a storm surge, a big one, and so we need to make the public more aware of this because they, a lot of people in the United States, I don't know about Japan, and a lot of, in the United States a lot of people think that the water just comes up very slowly and you have plenty of time to go up into the attic or something like that. No, not, not a big storm surge. Let's talk about some numbers here. Um, there are about, globally, on average, since 1971, about 10,000 people lose their lives every year from tropical cyclones, and about 700 billion US dollars in damages, on average, per year. Um, and this is very important. The global population that was exposed to hurricanes has tripled since 1970, and this is because people <coughs> everywhere just about everywhere, are moving away from inland areas to coastal regions for all kinds of different reasons. In both developed countries and developing countries, this is happening. So we have a problem that uh, hurricanes are causing more damage and affecting more people because more people are moving to places that have strong uh, hurricane problems. Now this next set of statistics is for the U.S., but I suspect qualitatively it applies elsewhere. If you look at the source of mortality in hurricanes, it's mostly from fresh water. Okay, this is the least, people tend to pay the least attention to this, but it's the main source of death. So that's from heavy rain and floods. This is from storm surge, salt water. And then only a relatively small number directly uh, are, are dying because of wind uh, problems. And then there are other things like tornadoes and other kinds of hazards, but the big two are the flooding problems. Now, 
in much of the de uh, developed world, I'm actually not sure what the situation here is in Japan, uh, fresh water and salt water damage are insured by federal or uh, national governments. Okay, it's certainly true in the US. And uh, in the United States and in many places, wind damage is privately insured. Now, I put these dollar signs here, and that simply indicate that there's a lot of money in insurance, so there's been an awful lot of research about wind damage. We know a lot more about how wind damages buildings and so forth. But because this is publicly insured, and at least our federal government doesn't put a lot of money into assessing these hazards, we know relatively less about uh, how these work. And so this is a big gap between what research scientists, I think, know and what the public needs is this particular aspect of the hazard. So water, really tropical cyclones should be more about water than about wind, okay? And yet we focus on wind. So uh, globally, in a particular year, this is 2006, these are privately insured losses, 79% from windstorms, 14% from floods and other things. This is private insurance. Remember, in most countries, it's not private insurance, but governments that insure against floods. So that's why floods are small on this diagram, but this is to illustrate insurance companies really want to know about the wind, all right? And yet, globally, that's not the big hazard. Globally, there have been big increases in damage uh, from say the 1950s to the present. This is damage that has been corrected for uh, GDP, it's in 2015 US dollars, but not for changing infrastructure. And so most of this trend uh, probably reflects this demographic trend of more and more people moving into hurricane or tropical cyclone <coughs> prone areas, okay? There may be some climate change signal, but we will never be able to, to know that from a statistic like this because it's so dominated by. So um, we can also ask, is uh, hurricane risk changing over time independent of the demographics? And that's a very difficult question. Um, it's very hard to answer this from historical records. The reason is this, if we look at you know, how these records are collected. Before the middle 1940s, most of what we know about tropical cyclones comes from newspaper accounts, ship's logs, and other sort of random sources of information. There's something really very systematic about attempts to collect that data. Um, beginning in 1943, we started to do routine aircraft reconnaissance, but only in the North Atlantic <coughs> and in the Western North Pacific. <coughs> and in the beginning, it was fairly crude. That is, we really weren't measuring winds, for example, from aircraft. We were just estimating winds. Uh, in some cases, we got had drop signs that were measuring pressure. In 1958, um, we started to put inertial navigation systems on aircraft that uh, measured how fast the airplanes were moving with respect to the ground. And with that and the airspeed, you could deduce what the flight level winds were, so that was a big advance, but not until 1958. By 1970, we were detecting tropical cyclones just about everywhere, okay, by the early 70s, but not necessarily getting very good intensity estimates. 1978, we started to do the satellite scatterometry that told us the winds in the outer regions of tropical cyclones, but not in the core because heavy rain absorbs the signals for this. We took a step backwards in 1987 by terminating the airborne reconnaissance in the Western Pacific, which I think is something that Western Pacific countries like Japan still suffer from. It's not, uh, much reconnaissance, although people like John Jay have been involved in Dot Star, which is an attempt to do more aircraft with reconnaissance in the Pacific, which I think is badly needed. We are making some progress. Uh, two years ago was the introduction of the 
technique that detects forward scattered radiation from GPS satellites and does a kind of scatterometry that theoretically should even work in the core. Okay, so without this background, I want to illustrate the big problems we have deducing trends from history. And uh, so what I've done here is to show you from the North Atlantic uh, best track data. The North Atlantic by far is the best observed place historically, <coughs> even though there are only 11% of the world's <coughs> tropical cyclones occur there. So that's just reality. And I've taken the best track data and I'm showing you the number of major hurricanes <coughs> over time, but I've divided the data into two sets, um, just to two halves basically. One is hurricanes that uh, either passed over the chain of the Lesser Antilles, the islands of the Eastern Caribbean, which were highly inhabited during this whole period and had vigorous newspapers and things like that. We pretty much knew all the historical events that passed over the Lesser Antilles during this period. Or they made landfall in the United States, or both, of course. And then that's in um, blue, okay? In red are all the other storms that didn't do either of those. They didn't pass through the Lesser Antilles and they didn't make landfall. So the idea is that in the early part of this period, some of these storms that didn't make landfall were no doubt missed. They're just not in the historical record. Uh, they didn't pass over land. Uh, they didn't happen to hit a ship. Um, something like that. And then if we look at trends in these two subsets, they're very, very different. And I don't really believe the real trend is any different, okay? This shows you, this gap back here, shows you the problems with the historical data. You really only were confident about a tropical cyclone in the late 19th century if it hit an island or a land or maybe a ship. And there are a fair number of of storms, maybe even strong storms like major hurricanes that didn't hit land or ships and they didn't, weren't reported. So if you want to detect a trend, uh, you really have a problem, okay, uh, with the historical data. Now we think we see some trends, but those could be argued too. So this is looking at the global tropical cyclone database for the period from 1980 to 2016. This is a period in which we knew about all tropical cyclones. Like we knew they existed, but still the problem of, of detecting tropical cyclones from space, uh, is uh, intensity from space is very tough, and it changed over time. So what you're seeing here is the percentage increase per decade of global storms whose lifetime maximum intensity exceeded 80 knots, 90 knots, 100 knots, and so forth. So the weak storms have absolutely no trend in, um, according to this analysis, in intensity. But when you start getting up to the higher intensities, you start seeing positive trends, percentage increases per decade, quite large, but with huge uncertainty as denoted by this shading. Even some of these trends can be questioned because our techniques for estimating intensity from space were changing over this time. So we have a big problem. One trend that we are a little bit more confident in, I think, is uh, Jim Cawson's work showing that the latitude at which tropical cyclones reach their peak intensity globally, as deduced from two different kinds of satellite analyses, uh, seems to be increasing. So this is the northern hemisphere. This is distance from the equator. It seems to be going up over time. Here's the time scale down here. This is the southern hemisphere. Distance from the equator deep, increasing downward. That's also increasing. So the storms seem to be reaching their peaks further away from the equator. And there's some indication, although this is very controversial still, that the translation speed, the movement of tropical cyclones, may be becoming uh, slower over time. Uh, I think the jury is out. So my point here is that history is too short and tropical cyclone measurements are too poor to make much deductions about climate. Now short period climate fluctuations like El Nino, we have much 
higher confidence in. We can detect those. But long-term trends, I think it's very, very tough to do that. However, there are some other techniques coming along. One is uh, what's called paleotempestology. It's the study of hurricanes in the prehistoric period based upon their effects in the geological record. So there are several different techniques. One of them is called an overwash technique. If you have an ocean here, and here is a barrier beach, often behind the beach here, you have a marsh or a lagoon, and plants are constantly growing and dying and forming mud. But a typhoon comes ashore, sand is washed into the marsh or the lagoon, and so if you take a rubber raft and you fill it with graduate students and they take a core down here, people have done this, okay, you can see these sand layers. And they are usually produced either by tsunamis or by typhoons. And you can radiocarbon date the mud around the sand and determine when that sand layer was deposited. It's really quite an interesting technique. Um, I'm, it's been done many places in the world, including here in Japan. Um, and so I have a colleague at Woods Hole, who was then at Woods Hole, uh, who worked in an area in the far northwest of Japan, up here, okay? And um, this is a blowing this up into this region. I'm sorry, it's, it, I, I misspoke. It's the far southwest of Japan. And this, this chain of islands here, but on the northwest, northeast side of that chain of islands. And this is a blowing up of that. Here is the ocean, here is a barrier beach, and here is a lagoon. And so they took cores and used radar to uh, look at this lagoon. So this is a seismic survey of this lagoon, showing where the cores were taken here, somewhere else, and here, okay? But the seismic survey shows that you have these nice layers of, of deposition occurring here. And so these can be sectioned. And this is the result. So this is years before present, going all the way back to 6,000 years. Uh, and this is a measure of the grain size in the deposits. So where you see large grain size, these are layers that are believed to have been put down by typhoons, although in some cases they might have been tsunamis. This is a similar uh, record, uh, but it is from uh, Peru, and it's not a proxy for tropical cyclones, but for El Nino. This is from um, big uh, fluvial fans in Peru, and when, the, <coughs> when there's an El Nino, it rains a lot there, and so this is a good proxy for that. And you might be able to see, uh, it depends on how much you want to believe this, that there may be a correlation between Western Pacific typhoons and El Nino. This is something we know is true in the modern record to some extent. And then this is a hurricane core from near Puerto Rico. And these are strongly anti-correlated with El Nino, just as in the modern times when we have El Nino in the Atlantic, we tend to suppress hurricanes. So you can look at these cores in much greater detail. This is now just going back a thousand years and looking at some of these uh, sand layers. Here's one that dates to about 1300 AD, and the authors of the paper ascribe this to one of the two typhoons that thwarted the Mongol invasions of Japan. Okay, so you can begin to see those in the records. It's a really interesting uh, study, but it hasn't been done in too many places yet. Um, we can look at some other quantities. I told you about potential intensity, and we can uh, look at trends and analysis data, but I want to show you something that's more theoretical. If you take a single column model, which has radiation and convection physics in it, and you subject it to a number of doublings of carbon dioxide, this is what the potential intensity does. This is, again, number of doublings. So if you, the first doubling, you go from a little bit less than 68 meters per second to 70 and a half, keep going up. Very interestingly, when you get to very high carbon dioxide, it saturates. And this is very understandable physics. Uh, that by the time you're this hot, basically the lower troposphere is almost completely opaque in the infrared because of water vapor. And uh, 
so there's almost no infrared flux at the sea surface. And any further changes in CO2 can't therefore change the evaporation rate of the ocean. It changes the ocean temperature. But for the early doublings, one might see a trend. And for what it's worth, this is a trend in potential intensity, a linear trend in 1980 to 2010, shown only where it's statistically significant at the 5% level. And what I want to show you is that in the Atlantic, most of the trends are in the deep tropics, some in the subtropical Atlantic. But in the Pacific, most of the trends are in the subtropics, both of the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere, like around here, for example. And there's not that much in the deep tropics. And the reason we think is because it's already so hot in the deep tropical Pacific that you, you're sort of already up pretty far up on this curve and it further increases in carbon dioxide really can't change the potential intensity anymore. This is a projection of potential intensity changes from a particular climate model under uh, this emission scenario 8.5 which is a very uh, high end emission scenario. But it's the same kind of pattern you see in the Pacific that the the changes, at least in the North Pacific, are mostly subtropical and not tropical trends. All right, so what have we, where are we at here? So we can infer from basic theory, potential density increases with global warming up to a point, but not indefinitely. Um, we would guess from this that the incidence of high intensity hurricanes should go up simply because you have more potential where you might have only been able to get up to 80 meters per second in the past, you might get up to 90%, 90 meters per second in the future. Increases uh, in potential intensity theoretically should be faster in the subtropics than in the deep tropics, and we see some sign of that. <coughs> And another fact that has nothing to do with potential density, which is much more simple actually, is that hurricanes should produce more rain just because of the clausius clapeyron equation, which gives you 7% more water vapor for every degree of warming of the lower uh, troposphere. All right, so what I'm, I've made two separate points. Uh, hurricane risk is increasing a lot because of demographics, but the climate uh, change would seem at least some indications are that it should make hurricanes more intense. The confluence of these two trends is very bad news because you have a lot of people moving to areas that are becoming increasingly dangerous. So how are we going to do the risk assessment? Well, the problem with risk has a natural science component. And this is up to us to estimate the risk of typhoons. People here. That's what we do, we study tropical cyclone physics. But the risk is a lot more than wind and rain and uh, storm surge, okay? The risk is when you take the event probability and you multiply it by the consequence of that event. All right? That's what's called risk. So it's not just knowing what the wind is, it's knowing what the wind will do to a structure constitutes the risk. So a uh, uh, 20 meter per second wind poses no threat to this building, right? but a 16 meter per second wind might pose a threat to this building. It depends on how it was built and so forth. The risk is a convolution of the event risk with the vulnerability of particular structures. So let me illustrate the nature of the problem. These are two probability curves. And uh, it's a probability of not uh, hurricane wind speed, but damage <coughs> done by hurricane winds, not water in this case, just wind. So this is the base 10 log of damage in US dollars. And this is the probability, uh, the probability density of that. Now there are two different curves. This has been deduced from hurricanes that have been downscaled from the climate model. It's actually a Japanese model. Uh, the blue is for the current climate, and the green is for a future climate. Now these curves, first of all, look very similar. There isn't very much change, at least apparently not very much change in this. At the low end, where you have, these are weak storms that don't do a lot of damage, 
you actually have a decrease. And that's because in this downscaling of this model, the number of storms actually falls and the number of weak storms goes down. But at this tail, which has low probability but very high damage, the risk goes up. Now, I'm not I'm going to argue whether this is true or not. I'm just trying to make a point about this. So if all we're concerned with is hurricane events, we would say, well, there's not much change. Now I'm going to show you a second graph, which is taking the probability density and multiplying it by the damage itself. All right, so it's the same two curves but I'm showing you damage times probability density. So if you integrate this damage times probability density over the log of the damage, you get the total damage done by all storms of all intensities. Because the area under the curve, and look what's happened, the area has more than doubled. And all of that increase has come from this low probability tail. All right? Now I'm not trying to get you to believe that these curves are correct. That's not the point of this. The point, the really important point, is that most of the risk comes from the tail of the event distribution. The low probability tail. It's really very simple. Societies are very well developed, adapted to disasters that occur every 20 or 30 years, or more frequently than that. We have a tropical cyclone with 50 knot winds every 20 years in Kyoto. Kyoto will, over historical times, be well adapted to that. But it's not going, no society, it turns out, empirically, is well adapted to events that occur every 200 years, or less frequently. So all the damage that comes from the rare events. All right? and that's very, very important to understand. We don't care what happens to the common events to first order. We care what happens to the extreme events. So risk is usually about extremes. So to summarize, societies are pretty well adapted to events that are more frequent than about once in 100 years. What's magic about 100 years? Three human generations or so. This is a, a field for sociology, not for us. But sociologists tell us, if it happened to you, you'll remember it. If it happened to your parents, they'll tell you about it. If it happened to your grandparents, they'll probably tell you about it, or they'll tell your parents who will tell you about it. Much beyond your grandparents, it, it's lost, okay, to cultural memory. It's an empirical fact, it's not a theory, okay? It just, you look at how these things occur. And so societies are often poorly adapted to rare events. If you want to look at an historical record of any kind of event, doesn't matter what it is, an earthquake, a volcano, a hurricane, you want a robust measure of the 100-year event, you need about 1,000 years of data. Okay. You're not going to have that. In most, in most cases, you're not going to have 1,000 years of data. And so, we don't have that. And yet, and yet, almost all real-world assessments of risk are based on an analysis of historical data. Okay, almost all. So if you own property, and I don't know how it works in Japan, frankly, but if you pay property insurance, I do in the U.S., if, you're, if you rent, you're paying it indirectly through your rent, the rate uh, is, is set by an insurance company in consultation with risk modelers who are statisticians looking at historical data. Right. There's no attempt to build physical modeling, really serious physical modeling, into this. And that's a huge gap between what we can do and what is being done, and it has very negative consequences. So, I'm hoping to get some students interested in bringing physics to bear on this problem. So how we do deal with it is uh, for local events, uh, I mean, how do we deal with this paucity of data for local events? We can do better by accumulating statistics, not, let's say we're interested in Kyoto. We don't just accumulate statistics for Kyoto, but for nearby cities, 
near enough that they're sampling the same climatology of whatever phenomenon you're interested in, but far enough that they're sampling in different individual events. All right, they're not generally sampling the same storms, different storms, but the same climatological distribution. So for example, uh, half a meter of, of tropical cyclone rain in Houston in the United States may be a 100-year event. But for any location in southeastern Texas, it would be a 20-year event, 20 20-year event. If you believe the climatology of tropical cyclones in Houston is no different from San Antonio, or Corpus Christi further down the coast, then you can use all of those stations to try to do better on estimating historical risk. The other thing you can do is uh, to do what statisticians do, is to extrapolate the probability density curves using something called extreme value theory, uh, so that you deduce what the very low probability uh, events are from the better sample, high, higher probability events. But this is dicey, okay? It really depends upon whether your assumptions about the general shape of that distribution are correct. But how we could deal with this is to bring what we understand about tropical cyclone physics to bear on this risk. Um, that's my most important message to you. It's, I'm gonna talk about how I do that that's just one example. That's uh, not something I'm necessarily advocating you do. But you might be interested in the more general problem of how do we bring physics modeling, if you will, physical modeling, to bear on this really important problem of natural hazard risk. And I'm going to specialize, of course, to the, to the particular risks of tropical cyclones. It's too important to leave to the statisticians. I'm not trying to insult the statisticians, but we have other ways of knowing about the world besides historical statistics. We have to bring everything to bear. But there are big impediments to doing it. Uh, we have, at least in, in Europe and the United States, something I call academic stovepiping. Uh, if a graduate student at MIT came to me and said he wanted to work on this, or she, I'd probably discourage them because I know people would say that's not science, that's engineering. Okay. And so uh, you were putting your career at risk if you make it to apply. And yet, if you wanted to get the insurance industry to do this, the physics is unknown to them largely and too complicated for them to worry about, so it doesn't happen. Um, I'm going to show you that for many hazards today, and this may change very rapidly, just brute force modeling is perhaps too expensive and practical for a lot of applications. I'll come back to that, what I mean by that. So one example is if we wanted to, to run uh, the wharf model, a hurricane model, uh, for a thousand years, okay, to get a robust estimate of risk, even if the climate is not changing, we might drive the wharf by boundary conditions run by, uh, provided by GCMs that are run for a thousand years. It's too expensive to do that now for most applications. That may change, or that is changing very rapidly, but right now it's too expensive. So we're going to try to do this, and why not just use climate models directly for this particular problem? Well, I say that they're still a bit too coarse to do this. So what I mean by that is um, this is a probability distribution, actually a frequency distribution of, of Eastern Pacific tropical cyclones by lifetime maximum wind speed in meters per second. This is from historical data. This line is the arbitrary division between category two and category three. So the winds that are destructive that do most damage are on this half of the plot. And then these have been modeled with a global model with pretty good, uh, sorry, this slide was created for a different audience, but this is like 50 kilometer grid, okay? That's pretty good for a GCM. I know we have models that are much higher resolution, but not that you can run for a thousand years, okay? And so, um, we're not simulating with this kind of model the storms that are destructive. Um, okay, so how we deal with this, which has its own limitations, is we embed a high-resolution 
fast coupled ocean atmosphere hurricane model. It's called CHIPS, which we developed originally just as a forecasting tool uh, in a global climate model or climate reanalysis data. And I'll show you how we do that. This is the CHIPS model. We've, it's been used operationally. It's been run for real-time forecasts for about 18 years now. 16 years according to the slide, but the slides are really old. And um, this model is more complicated by uh, quite a bit from the model I talked to you about this morning. It's called the Coupled Hurricane Intensity Prediction System, that's why it's called CHIPS. But like the simple model I showed you, it's framed in a coordinate system uh, in which uh, angular momentum is the independent radial variable. It's not actually angular momentum, it's this quantity uppercase R, the potential radius whose square is proportional to the angular momentum. And like the model I described this morning, um, it assumes hydrostatic ingredient balance above the boundary layer. It assumes slantwise neutrality, except in the eye. Uh, but it has a representation of convection, which is really important for real storms because, principally, of their abil the ability of downdrafts, convective downdrafts, to transport low entropy air into the boundary layer. It's a very important process that was omitted from what I talked to you about this morning. It has sort of classical turbulence schemes, and as I mentioned, it's coupled to a one-dimensional ocean model where the physics is really the physics of mixing. And we have a uh, parameterization of the effects, very important effects of wind shear. It's a parameterization that was sort of optimized over a long period of time to optimize uh, actual operational intensity forecast. So just to emphasize, this is from a model. This is the center of a mature hurricane. You're going out. And these are surfaces of constant angular momentum with equal spacing in angular momentum. And the point is that angular momentum surfaces have become very packed together in the eye wall. Uh, remember, the eye wall actually wants to be discontinuous. And so, in some sense, you're getting much, if, if this is your coordinate system, you're getting much better resolution here, which just turns out where you need it in the eye wall, at the sacrifice of poor resolution outside the eye wall. So, by phrasing the equations with angular momentum, uh, first of all, the equations are mathematically simpler, and secondly, uh, they give you variable spatial resolution, which is very high where you need it in proportion to how intense the storm is. How good is it in forecast? Well, it's not great, but it's not terrible either. So this is the RMS intensity errors for operational predictions in the North Atlantic as a function of lead time. So this is the National Hurricane Center uh, forecast, which is a subjective blend of all kinds of different guidance. Uh, this was a then state-of-the-art model back in this error, GFDL model, very good model. And then this is this CHIPS model, all right? So at these intermediate times, it clearly has higher errors, but at longer times, it's sort of competitive with the other models. But this model takes 10 seconds to run on a laptop. That model takes an hour to run on a supercomputer. So it's, it's a different you know, level of computation. The simple model does things that are surprising in some way. So this is uh, an example of a CHIPS model run for a particular storm. And what I'm showing you is the maximum wind speed over time. This is August through September dates. And it produces secondary eye walls. I'm not even sure why it does that. These happen when you have uh, angular momentum surfaces outside of the radius of maximum winds that begin to move inward. And that's what you're seeing here. The maximum, the secondary maximum wind speed, it moves inward, replaces the primary, and the, and the intensity typically goes up after that. So you see these three uh, eye wall replacement cycles. And this is just the radius of maximum <coughs> showing the secondary. So this, you get this ring forming at higher radius and moving in and so forth. That's how the CHIPS model uh, 
makes the storm get bigger over time. If it wants to get bigger over time, it does so by a succession of eye wall replacements. When the storm is rapidly decaying, this model also does something interesting. It does what I call a primary eye wall cycle. This is actually the mirror image. This is not really showing it here, but typically a, um, a new eye wall actually forms within the inside the old eye wall and expands and takes over the old eye wall. Whether that happens in nature, I have no idea. Uh, well, that's just some, I just wanted to mention, if you're interested in a real-time forecast of all tropical cyclones in the world, uh, can be found at this website. And so that not only shows you the CHIPS forecast, but some of the other models that are used operationally, if you want to look at that. Uh, I've already shared with that. So can we take this and use it to assess long-term cyclone risk, both in the current and future climates? So what we do, it's pretty radical, I didn't actually think it would work, um, is the CHIPS model only forecasts intensity, it doesn't forecast the track, and it doesn't forecast the genesis. So if we're going to have a risk model, we better understand how to do genesis, and we better understand uh, how to do the tracks. So what we do, it's a pretty radical idea, is we, the genesis is pretty simple. We randomly see the entire ocean uh, with a very large number of weak proto-cyclones, weak, weak tropical cyclones. We call them seeds. Um, these seeds are assumed to move with a large-scale atmospheric flow in which they're embedded, which comes from a reanalysis data set or a climate model, plus a correction for the Earth's rotation. So you see the so-called uh, beta, it's a so-called beta and advection model, which used to be used in the old days to forecast field hurricanes. So the real crucial step is you run this CHIPS model along each track, and it predicts that way more than 99% of the seeds just die. Okay? So that all these seeds you put down most of them fail. Most of them just give up and die. Because you put them in an environment with large shear or cold water or something like that. So it's kind of a natural selection algorithm. And it just picks out the ones that are going to survive. And it's typically a very small fraction. Even so, you can afford to generate 100,000 events very fast this way. Right? Um, we, frankly, when we decided to try doing this, we didn't think it was going to work. For example, uh, Atlantic storms in this seeding method have no idea that they're easterly waves present. They have no knowledge of easterly waves. We're representing a large-scale environment in a very um, statistical way. Uh, you can read details in this particular paper. So let me get into a lot, somewhat more detail of this. Um, we specifically postulate that the storms move with a vertically average environmental flow, as I mentioned, plus a beta drift correction. With the environmental flow, I'm only using a weighted average of flow at two levels. No particular reason why, uh, but we don't know better than to do that, I would argue. So we take these flows from the climate model, but we don't actually use them directly. What we do is we derive certain statistics from the climate model of the analysis, the monthly mean values of the flow at those two different levels, the variances of daily values from their monthly means, and the covariances among the four components. So you have U and V at two different levels, there are four wind components. And then we, sit, we manufacture time series synthetically by using Fourier series of random phase, but which are constrained to exactly have the right monthly mean, that is the same as the climate model or the reanalysis, and the correct variances and covariances among these four components, and that obeys a frequency to the minus third power law, okay, as quasi-geostrophic turbulence and observations show for synoptic scale. The reason we do this, rather than use the winds directly, is because we want to have a potentially infinite number of realizations of flows that have the same statistics as the actual flows from the reanalysis data set. 
So those winds are used to drive the track model and to provide the wind shear for the intensity model. We have to do a calibration. That's a basically one-time calibration of the rate at which you throw down these seeds. And it's calibrated to give you the correct global frequency over a particular period of time. It's a choice you have to make. So here is an example of a thousand tracks downscaled from an ERA interim reanalysis. Okay, and um, maybe a bit too few storms in the Atlantic compared to the Pacific. Uh, you can look at this um, just as in the real historical tracks, you have to decide when you're going to call it quits on the tropical cyclone. When does the track end? So it's somewhat subjective. When the wind speed gets below a threshold, when it becomes bare clinic, when do you stop the track? In this case, the tracks are stopped, I think, when the wind falls below 25 knots or something like that. This is <laughs> showing you observations of genesis points over a period of time in the North Atlantic. And these are from seeding uh, NSEP reanalyses. These are the points at which we put down the seeds that turned out to survive. We threw away all the ones that didn't survive. And you see interesting similarities and differences. Uh, so for example, there are a lot more storms in the historical database that form up here even one off uh, Cape Cod and one off Nova Scotia. I don't really think those are tropical cyclones. I think those were extra tropical cyclones that got accidentally classified. As, I never could conceive of a tropical cyclone forming over the cold water uh, southeast of Nova Scotia. So these are, there are some of the, uh, these are all real events, but whether they're strictly tropical cyclones, these are probably, some of these are probably subtropical and we don't capture those. But there's all kind of a minimum of activity and well-known in the Caribbean, and we seem to get that pretty well. All right, so we can do a lot with this. Um, here is a graph showing 100 uh, storms downscaled from a particular climate model, actually, but during the 20th century that came within um, uh, 200 kilometers of Kyoto. Okay. So these tracks came up here, went off by and large to the north, and if we superimpose some historical best tracks on here, well, you can see that they kind of do the same thing. But of course, you want to do a much more quantitative comparison. This is a particular track um, from this set, where the colors show the maximum wind speed this is dates in September. Um, and, and this one reached its peak intensity down here to the south and then came ashore here uh, and it has a fairly high category event. This is showing the surface winds uh, swath. This is the peak wind speed experience at every point during this event, which came up along this black line. The strongest winds in this case or to the right of the track, and you can see the strong influence of land and the slowing down the surface winds. Here is a time series of surface wind at Kyoto itself from the same event I just showed you. This is wind speed and knots and wind direction. Okay, and the model. Uh, so I'll say more about this in a minute. Produces rain. This is a very very tough thing to do, uh, and it's very tough to evaluate. And it's new uh, for us. And we'll come back and talk about it. For this one event, I don't know, this shows the contours of rain. And so to the mountains to the southeast of us, um, we got about 500, millibar, 500 uh, millimeters of rain from this storm. But there's a lot of topographic influence and so forth from the rain. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, the chips model is asymmetric. Yes. Um, and so, how, how do you calculate the rainfall? I'm going to come back and talk about okay. that. It's, it's clearly not a very symmetric rainfall field. In fact, even the wind field isn't symmetric. Just hang on, I'll come back to that. Okay. This is just the time, this is the rain rate at Kyoto from this one event. 
over time. So we reach a peak rate of about 25 millimeters per hour. So if we look at all those events, this is now uh, for storms downscale from a particular reanalysis, the NCEP, NCAR NCEP reanalysis over a period of 1979 to 2017. And what you see on this curve uh, from this model is um, the red is the mean return period. It's actually the return period based on the mean frequencies <coughs> deduced from the, these four reanalysis products. Um, and this is not wind at Kyoto. This is the lifetime maximum wind of storms that ultimately affected Kyoto. It's a little bit different. Simply because we, there are not enough storms that that um, affected Kyoto that you can get a robust estimate from the historical. But if you look at the lifetime maximum wind speeds, there are enough events in the historical record you can do this. So the blue dots are directly deduced from best track data over this period of time. There's 61 tracks that meet this criteria. And the shading shows you the standard deviation among the four reanalyses. So this is the sort of thing you can get. But you can go much further along this return period curve if you wanted to, just by adding events than you can for the historical data. Um, this is the same thing. Um, it's, uh, wait a minute, I misspoke on the first one. This is from a single reanalysis, but the shading shows the expected sampling error uh, if you have the same frequency or same number of events that you have in the historical period. So in other words, if these two distribution, if the best tracks were drawn from the same distribution as the synthetic tracks, then 90% of them should fall within that blue shading. Okay, that's our way of looking at uncertainty. But this one is from the four reanalyses. There's no, I didn't put the historical observation, but this is lifetime maximum wind of storms affecting Kyoto. And the shading shows the scatter. So in this case, there's almost the downscaling from four different reanalyses agreeing with each other very well. That's for wind. This is the same thing for rain. Here there's much more disagreement among the different reanalyses about rain return periods. Sorry, this is wind. Um, I, I misspoke again at Kyoto. But this is wind at Kyoto, not lifetime maximum wind. And this is the rain. Okay. So you can do this sort of thing, and if you try to compare it to historical statistics, you're hard up against the fact that there are not that many storms in the historical database. So the blue is from historical data. This is an annual frequency uh, exceedance. So in the best track data set, set from 1990 to 2005, there were uh, um, 12 storms per year on average that exceeded 40 knots, and uh, nine storms that exceeded 50 knots, and so on. The red is from the synthetic tracks, and then these error bars show the 90% uh, limits um, that are the predicted sampling error uh, from the best tracks. Now, another thing you can do is you can look at the statistics of intensification rates. And um, what this diagram shows is the natural, the log uh, 10 of the probability of encountering um, uh, six hour, uh, six hour, 12 hour changes. Now this is knots per hour. Encountering uh, intensity changes greater than the value you see on this axis, both positive for intensifying storms and negative. The red is from the synthetic tracks and the blue is from historical tracks. Now, there's an important lesson here, forgetting about the synthetic tracks for a minute, okay? Uh, this has been done in many different parts of the world for reasons we don't know. The probability density of intensification rates is exponential. That is, it's straight lines on a plot where this is the log of the probability. So the probability falls off exponentially with the rate of intensification. A challenge. Why? Why not Gaussian or why not some other shape? It's exponential. Empirically, it's exponential. 
There's no theory for this. The other important lesson is there is no break in this. It's a straight line, doesn't change slope appreciably. Of course, in the best track data, it gets very noisy down in here because there are not very many events. Uh, so this diagram shows there is no such thing as rapid intensification. It doesn't exist. What do I mean by that? I mean that it's a human construct. We say if it's more than 30 knots in 24 hours, it's rapid intensification. Okay, we're allowed to say that. But nature doesn't have a number. Okay, nature isn't picking a number and saying that's rapid. The physics of a rapidly intense, there's no information that suggests the physics of, rap, of what we call rapid identification is any different from the physics of the rest of the distribution. No break in the distribution. So nature doesn't care. Nature has this nice probability distribution, and that's important to know, that there is no magic number. We can invent the number and call it rapid identification if we like, but it has no meaning physically. Of course, it has a meaning for operational forecasts. Otherwise, we wouldn't invent it, all right? But it's not like storms that are intensifying fast are, under, are operating on different physics than storms that are. They're part of a completely continuous distribution with no change in slope. All right. So next time you hear about rapid intensification, at least remember that. Uh, and you can forget about the synthetic tracks. They happen to do the same thing. But the historical data is, is clear on this point. This just illustrates that in places like New England, where we do have damaging hurricanes, but not very many of them, um, this is a return period of wind speeds of storms affecting New England. The green dots are deduced purely from historical data, and the blue dots from a large set of synthetic events. And forget about the red curve, it's just a uh, theoretical curve fit to the synthetic tracks. But the point is, you can get much further along, you can identify much rarer events if you have a large number of events, obviously. So that's one advantage of, the principal advantage of that. The annual cycle, the number of storms per month, this happens to be from the North Atlantic, from historical data in blue from the synthetic tracks in red, it's not bad. And this is looking at the number of storms in the North Atlantic uh, for three different phases of something called the Atlantic Meridional Mode and two different phases of ENSO, um, so a, a total of six, comparing the number of historical tracks with the number of synthetic tracks. And this is just put up here so that you realize that the um, technique seems to know the difference between an El Nino and a La Nina here, and maybe some of these uh, different um, phases of the AMM. And it even gets some of the interannual variability. Uh, so this is historical data. This is something called storm maximum power dissipation in the North Atlantic, in blue from observations, in red from downscaling uh, NCAR NCEP reanalysis year by year, and um, about 65% of the variance. Uh, you know, regional models that are uh, much more complete than the simple model get similarly high uh, representations. We can downscale something called the 20th century reanalysis. This is a particular reanalysis. The Europeans are doing this now, in which the only Things that are, are data that are assimilated are surface, uh, sea surface temperature and sea ice uh, coverage. There's no atmospheric information except surface pressure. So you have the three things, surface pressure, ocean temperature, and um, sea ice. And the, the point of doing that is that there are records of these things going somewhat further back in time than the upper atmospheric variables. So, the rest of it's the model. The model's filling in, basically. It's being told what the surface pressure is, the ocean temperature, and sea ice. And so what you're seeing is a frequency of major hurricanes in this downscaling from this reanalysis product. And the green is just a smooth version of that. And you can see the sort of increase into mid-century, and then an abrupt decline, 
and then a big increase at the end of the 19th, of 20th century and the early 21st century. Now this is the well-known North Atlantic hurricane drought. You see it in the actual hurricane records and you see it in the downscaling. And this is a completely separate digression that I'm going to show you here. I'm going to put up here another curve that you will wonder why I'm putting on the same diagram. It's an inverted and scaled curve of uh, European sulfur emissions from factories and power plants during this time. And you can see that there's a pretty good correspondence here. And um, I have a PhD student working on this. We think that the big North Atlantic hurricane drought of the late 20th century was principally caused by European sulfur emissions. And the root is kind of interesting. So these get uh, catalyzed into sulfate particles, which are a haze, if you will, aerosols, that are highly reflective. They tend to locally cool the planet. Uh, planet. And in particular, in the summertime, these get carried down over the Mediterranean and uh, North Africa and cause, we believe, by interfering with solar radiation over Africa, a prolonged drought in the Sahel. That drought led to a big increase in the production of Saharan mineral dust, which gets carried out over the tropical Atlantic and cools the Atlantic. That's the hypothesis. And so my student is trying to see if we can collect enough data to evaluate whether that hypothesis is any good. Just an aside, okay? Um, once you have the wind events, and I actually don't have a discrete, you would ask me, I think you would ask me about the whole wind field. All we're recording for you, because you have, you know, 100,000 events, it's too much data to record the whole wind field. And the size of chips doesn't resolve the wind field very well outside the core. So we have an elaborate procedure where we fit these theoretical wind profiles I talked about yesterday to the radius of maximum winds, the maximum wind speed, and the outer radius, which is produced by the model. That gives us an axisymmetric wind field, and then we add two components to that. And one is um, the 850 millibar background wind, because the whole vortex is moving on. And another is an isalabark component to the wind. It's a correction to the gradient wind that's related to the interaction between the shear, uh, environmental shear and the vortex. It's a, a long discussion about how we do that. But the wind field, the gradient wind field itself is not symmetric by the time we're done with it. And uh, we put a boundary, a real boundary layer under that that interacts with topography and surface roughness so you get lots of local variations that way. Anyway, once you have the wind field, you can use it for each of these events to drive hydrodynamic wind surge models. And here are, are the computational grids for two such models. Uh, one is a public model called SLOSH, that's this regular polar grid. Another is a much more sophisticated model on a somewhat unstructured grid you see by these points here, called ADSER. And uh, this is for a study that I did with some other people for surge risk at the Battery, the southern end of Manhattan Island, where there has been a tide gauge measuring storm surges since 1923. Um, and we produced from a large set of synthetic hurricanes this analysis of surge risk at the battery. So this is return period. And by the way, the return period is just the inverse of the annual probability. That's its definition. Um, it's a funny number. But. And this is the magnitude in meters of the surge at the battery. Uh, this is just the surge itself. And then this is what happens if it happens at high tide, basically. There'll be additional tide on top of the surge. And uh, this we study we published in 2010, and two years later there was a big storm there called Sandy. And if you look at Sandy's measured surge and consider the state of the tide at the time, that would have been about a 400-year event for um, Sandy. 
And other groups also concluded that Sandy was a rare event. It was very destructive. It was like a four or five, six hundred year event for that area. So the point is that once you have the wind events, you have the ability to generate storm surges through a coupling to a hydrodynamic model. Now, the rainfall is a recent thing that we've done, and we have a very interesting challenge here. The TIPS model does predict updraft and downdraft mass fluxes as a function of time and potential radius, but if you were to store all those variables at each radius or each potential radius, um, you would increase the storage requirements by a factor of 50. And that's a consideration when you're generating 100,000 tracks. Okay? It's not a consideration if you were generating 20 tracks. But for 100,000, it's a big deal. So we have kind of a storage issue. So what we do is we don't store that. We just store the canonical variables, the radius of maximum winds, the maximum wind speed, the outer radius. We fit these wind profiles, as I just described to you. So uh, we, after the, the tracks have been generated, so this after the fact, we, uh, we generate the whole background wind. And then for the rain, we're going to allow this vortex to interact with background dynamical and thermodynamic fields. Now, this is, I guess I left out some slides for the sake of time. Basically, we're using quasi-geostrophic or quasi-balanced dynamics to do this. We have the vortex, we know the background wind, and so we know have all the components of solving something like a quasi-geostrophic omega equation. A little bit more complicated because we have a lower boundary condition on omega, which is the cyclone's winds interacting with topography. We have the strong Ekman pumping that has to be included. There's a lot of work that goes into us, but at the end of the day, we can unpack the very simple variables we actually store into a full time-evolving two-dimensional rain field that knows about the topography, variations in the drag coefficient, and so forth. Uh, that's okay, but does it work? It turns out trying to understand whether this really works with rain is much more difficult than for wind. We only, in the US, we only have about 32 years of radar data to do this. We have rain gauges that go back much further into the early 20th century, but they're largely maintained by volunteers. They can be unreliable and strong winds. And so I had an intern from Switzerland, Monica Feldman, who did this very uh, carefully over a long period of time, uh, using both radar and gauge data from uh, 35 radar sites and within 100 kilometers of each site. So uh, this work is in review at the moment, but here are the NixRAD stations uh, that we actually use, those blue dots, okay? And then there are lots and lots of rain gauges around this. It was very tough, but she did it. And, you know, the results are about the best you can do, and they're not all that great. Uh, but what you see here is storm total rainfall on this axis and the annual frequency from 10 to the minus third, or once per thousand years, all the way up to 10 or 10 times per year on this axis. The blue is what you infer from rain gauge data, historically, just directly inferring it from the, looking at the statistics of tropical cyclone rainfall recorded by rain gauges. This is for Jacksonville, Florida, the particular NEXRAD site. The red is from NEXRAD data, okay? So you can see that the two different observational analyses, they agree very well at high frequency, but not very well at low frequency. And then the um, those gray dots are from many synthetic events in the procedure I just described. And then the shading is an estimate of the sampling error you sampled from the synthetic events at the rate of the historical events. Uh, and that sampling error gets very large as you get to low frequency because you have one or two events. So the sampling error becomes extremely large. The blue shading 
is for rain gauges, the red is from the radar. So that's Jacksonville, that's Houston, Texas, Birmingham, which is inland in Alabama, so it's 100 kilometers or so from the coast. Uh, those are pretty good, I would say, but um, here's State College, Pennsylvania. That's quite far from the coast, and it's at high latitudes. It's affected by extratropical transition, which we don't pretend to be able to do very well. It's okay at high frequency, but you start to get some divergence at low frequency. Mm -hmm. And then going from the bad to the ugly, this is a city in the western part of Virginia, in a mountainous region, where the radar and the rain gauges get, get much lower frequencies than the synthetic tracks do. So you know, this is what you can do, I think, at this point in time to try to get uh, rain gauge, uh, uh, rain risk. Let me finish by saying once you develop this technique, you can try to apply it to climate change. Uh, can I ask yes, a please do. Uh, yeah. How can we define the storm total rainfall, the definition? Yeah. Definition. Okay, that's an excellent question. So you have to decide, right, uh, when, mm. you know, in the summertime, it's always raining in some ways. Mm -hmm. We have conductive showers all the time. Mm -hmm. um, what, when is it tropical cyclone rain? Mm -hmm. and when is for the synthetic tracks, it isn't a problem because it's all tropical cyclones. Mm -hmm. For the real data, it is. And Monica and I spent a long time on this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically, we use a criterion that the storm had to be a certain distance, distance. from, from mm -hmm. the, before we decided it was the rain was associated mm -hmm. with the storm. Fortunately, in most of these events, most of the rain falls when the storm is close by. Mm -hmm. Not all of it. Most of it, most of the time. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot that goes into this that I'm skipping over. Mm -hmm. and hopefully, I mean, if you write to me, I can send you a draft of this paper when it's under review. Mm -hmm. We have some reviews back; they're quite good, but we don't have them all back. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Related to this, how did you get the 2D distribution of the rainfall? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that goes back to, you first unpack the wind field into a whole two-dimensional wind field. So radius versus height. You uh, add in um, the interaction between that vortex wind field and the background wind, which you know, right? Because you saved that from when you generated the tracks. The background wind comes from the reanalysis or the climate model. Then you use quasi-balanced dynamics to get the omega field, the vertical velocity field, in three dimensions, okay? Taking into account the topography as well. Taking into account the topography, variations in the surface roughness. So basically, the lower, at the top of the boundary layer, the vertical motion comes from topography mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Ekman pumping. Okay, so I've been pumping given that the drag coefficient is varying. When we use actual tabulated drag coefficients as a function of space. Okay. That gives you the vertical motion at the top of the boundary layer. Then there's an additional component. Broadly speaking, we get it from quasi-balanced dynamics. We know, because we know the vortex, and we know its evolution of time, for example, we know the rate of change of vorticity. You know the rate of change of vorticity you can take a pretty good shot at what the stretching term is in the vorticity equation. And that gives you dwdz, mm. by which you can get from the top of the boundary layer to the middle troposphere. Mm. It's very involved, and I've skipped it here, okay? But I can give you the paper in which it's got. It's a very involved kind of analysis. Excuse me? Yeah. So in, in chips, chips model, has uh, any uh, microphysical parameterization? Or that is the no. name for it? <laughs> from the, no, uh, no. The, it should. It's a very, very is, good question. Uh, Basically, is. we assume a universal precipitation efficiency mm -hmm. in the core of tropical cyclones. And it's close to one. And I don't defend that. I mean, it's just too crude a model. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't want to attach a Rolls Royce to a donkey. It, it's not the kind of model you can feasibly, with a straight face, put a good microphysical scheme into. Yes. 
I think you're saved by the fact that the precipitation efficiency in the cores of tropical cyclones tends to be very yeah. high. And that's where most of the rain's coming from. Now, so what you're not trying to do mm -hmm. is make a weather forecast. You're not trying yeah. to say, this storm is going to reduce rain here and not there. You're trying to get the long-term statistics of rain right. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, you know, some storms may be more efficient than others. And you're kind of averaging over, you know, 10,000 storms or so. Yes. And you sort of hope to be able to produce this. If you're after getting the statistics right. No, we don't have any real microfluidics in the world. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. I think it's nice to have a short break. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, I'm almost finished, but sure, we can do that anyway. Yeah. So let's have a break until 11.50. Mm -hmm. Eight minutes break or so. Yeah, that's fine. I know you are very tough, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let me know if you have any trouble. 
independent of historical tropical cyclone data, except, of course, to evaluate the technique. You know, we're not using, in the technique itself, historical statistics. So you can equally well apply it to a climate model. And we can think about climate change effects. There's going to be more moisture in the boundary layer. Because of potential intensity, we expect some storms to be stronger in general, not everywhere. Uh, but, uh, and this is a little bit more controversial, we, we, the theory says that inner core should be more compact relative to the outer radius. It doesn't tell you whether the outer radius will change with climate. Assuming it doesn't change with climate, you should actually have smaller inner cores. And that will actually, in terms of rain, work the opposite direction. If everything else being equal to a smaller core, it's not going to rain as long. And so that will actually work to reduce rainfall. But the, the storm diameters might get bigger. Uh, it's not out of the question. We don't know that they will. And the storms might be moving faster or slower. And all of those would affect the damage that tropical cyclones could do. And so how do we do that? Well, we can downscale climate models. So this, we did this twice, basically. We did this for CMIP-3 models, the previous generation. These are seven models. They're, if you recognize the acronym, it's actually two Japanese models in red, uh, bright red and deep red. And this just shows the change in frequency between the end of the 20th century and the end of the 21st century. Um, uh, for uh, a particular scenario called A1b, which is a fairly modest, uh, moderate increase in carbon dioxide. And so the different colored bars are for different models, and then we've divided up the basins, Atlantic, Eastern Pacific, West Pacific, North Indian, and Southern Hemisphere. And you can see that it's kind of a wash. There, it, there's a little tiny, and there's a lot of variation from one model to the next, a little tiny bit of increase in the Atlantic, a more consistent increase in the Pacific, but declines in the East Pacific, the North, certainly in the North Indian Ocean and the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so it's kind of all, this is for storm frequency. But when we did the C5 models, now this is being displayed somewhat differently under a different emission scenario, which is 8.5, and it's not, it's not the same climate models, it's a different set. Uh, this is the, from 1980 to 2100, this is the so-called 20, 20th century or historical period, and this is the uh, future period. This is not frequency anymore, it's power dissipation. It's basically the <coughs> interval of the cube of the maximum wind speed over the life of each storm accumulated over each year. And the shading shows the scatter among the seven models, six models we used in this case, which is large. And that seems to show an increase over the 20, uh, 21st century. Now, there's no way to know whether this is right until we wait for nature to do this, but it is inconsistent with many other studies that have been done of this using mostly direct output from climate models. That tends to show a global decrease in the frequency of storms, although some of them that are uh, particularly high resolution show an increase in the incidence of high category storms. So uh, we don't know whether this is right but it's what the technique predicts. Very different from CMIP-3 to CMIP-5. Uh, CMIP-5, I have no idea why, although it's a different emissions trajectory in this case, and they're different models. Um, this is the implications that this sort of has. This is going back to CMIP-3. This is another study we did about the effect of climate change on surge risk at this particular place. But here we're assuming the sea level in general goes up a meter at the end of the, this century. And so this is four different CMIP-3 models. This is the end of the 20th century. These curves are at the end of the 21st century. The difference between the red and blue is we also assume in the case of red that the storms are a little bit larger in diameter. But they all show increased surge risk at the battery 
uh, mostly from sea level rise, but also partly because the storms in this particular place were a bit more intense. Um, and, you know, we've been using that to do real world things like uh, if you're going to, here's New York, this is um, Staten Island, uh, this is the East River, Manhattan is here, the Battery is there. <coughs> and we uh, worked with some economists and engineers to sort of cost out various different kinds of solutions for protecting New York from storm surges. A very extensive one is to build a storm barrier all the way from Long Island to New Jersey, this very large red barrier, and one at the East River. Another possibility was just to make each individual building more resilient to flooding. This is much cheaper, but far less effective. And so, I mean, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this. <laughs> we calculate something called the benefit to cost ratio for doing this. This is for the current climate, and it depends on your assumption of the economic discount rate. But for the two scenarios I just described, these are all less than one, which means it's not worth doing it if you're interested in protecting yourself in the current climate. In the future climate, these numbers are generally larger than one uh, for both kinds of projects, and so it might be worth doing them if you're worried about the situation in the uh, end of the century. So this is just an example of how you can take physical risk and try to translate that into action or potential actions. Um, I'm going to try to end up by putting particular tropical cyclone events in the context of climate change. That's something we can do. We cannot say whether they're caused by climate change. That's ridiculous. But we can talk about how the probabilities evolve. So I'll talk about two storms. This is Tropical Cyclone E-Day 2019, which is the second deadliest in the southern southwest Indian Ocean, third deadliest in the southern hemisphere in history. Uh, peak winds of 100 knots, more than 5 millimeters of rainfall in a few places. Storm surge of 4.4 meters at Beira in Mozambique, 90% of which was destroyed. This is a horrible disaster, and it's still ongoing right now. And we still haven't even uh, begun to recover from that, and more than 1,000 people. This is a NASA analysis of the <coughs> rainfall. Uh, in Mozambique and the surrounding areas in the southwest Indian Ocean, so Beira is around there. The high, it, uh, unfortunately, they didn't put a color scale on this, but the highest values are about 500 millimeters uh, in this case. If we run um, 7C MIP-5 models and look at tropical cyclones that pass within a certain distance of Beira, these uh, show the wind speeds at the end of the 20th century with a scatter shown by uh, among the seven models by the shading. And at the end of this century under RCP 8.5, and this is the actual peak wind in this particular tropical cyclone. So we could say that by the standards of the late 20th century, that might have been a 90-year event. Not so very rare, but um, and by the standards of the late 21st century, maybe a 30 or 40 year event. So an increase in probability, but with a fair bit of uncertainty. And this is the same thing for rain. Um, this was, at least by this standard, not so uncommon. And by the end of the 20th century, maybe a 70 or 80 year event. If it occurred at the end of this century, it'd be more like a 20 year event. Okay? Neither very uncommon. So we can use techniques like this to at least make a stab at how probabilities are changing. So I think you know about this one, right? This occurred last year here. Um, and it was the strongest I read, at least, the strongest typhoon to hit Japan since Yancey in 1993. It had a sustained wind, as far as I can make out, of about 90 knots at landfall. If you know differently, tell me. I I was trying to look these up uh, last week. It broke historical records at 53 weather stations for sustained winds <coughs> and at 100 weather stations for maximum gust in Japan. It had a storm surge of 3.3 meters at Osaka and it 
uh, killed some people and injured quite a few people. And if we do the same analysis for Kyoto, this is based on five CBIT5 models. Um, this, there is a climate change signal. It's not that strong uh, here. There's a lot of overlap. Um, and 60 knots here would have been maybe about a 100-year event by the standards of the late 20th century. And it might be, you know, with some uncertainty, more like a 40- or 50-year event by the end of this century. Uh, for rain, it's more of a, it's a clearer signal. Uh, I didn't really get a good estimate of rainfall in the storm. Of course, it varies a whole lot with topography, but anyway, uh, regardless, it wasn't such an uncommon rain event. It was, I guess, pretty fast moving. And so, yeah, it was a heavy rainstorm, but not very unusual. You know, maybe a 20-year event <coughs> by the end of the 20th century, and maybe it's five years or something. In the century. But when you look at 100,000 events, you see black swans. And I think these are interesting. I'll tell you why. This is a typhoon. I think I sent this to you, John Jay. Where are you? I think I sent yep. you this graph. Yep. A particular event that stalled, very intense storm, typhoon stalled southwest of Taiwan, which is here. This is a storm total rain, seven meters. Okay. Now you might think that's crazy. But there is a typhoon, was it Morakot, produced in some places 2.5 meters of rain. Almost three. Yeah. Almost three meters. So mm -hmm. this is not crazy. All right. These are point measurements. Uh, and this is a much warmer climate. This is in the year 2087. All right. So it's not completely crazy. Now, why I think that's interesting is the obvious thing is, are you going to plan for an event like that? What would that do to Taiwan? But beyond the human dimension to that, there's something really interesting, is that rain and landslides are a very important part of the structural evolution of landscape. It's a matter of geology. And geologists will tell you that in places like Typhoon, the whole geological evolution of the island is sculpted by not just tectonics, but by rain. And so, is climate change going to influence the morphology of, Thai, of Taiwan, or other places as well, as a matter of geology? It's an open question. Nobody has really addressed this. It's obviously not important if you're concerned with 100 years, but if you're concerned with a million years, um, this is an interesting problem. Uh, let me just summarize. I think I almost made it on time. Uh, what I've been trying to say is the record of hurricanes, tropical cyclones, is too short and too low quality to make robust inferences of climate signals. In many cases, there is some indication from satellite data of a migration of peak intensity toward higher latitudes <coughs> and maybe a greater fraction of the storms. It's pretty dicey, though. Uh, hurricane proxies from the geological record, it's not just overwash deposits, there are other proxies. That's very promising, but there are very few people doing it, okay? I think it's very exciting work. And you're beginning to see some climate signals in this data, like ENSO. Uh, on the theoretical side, potential intensity should increase uh, with rising temperature, at least for a while. Um, Reanalysis data seems to show this is happening. Potential intensity is going up. You can use physics uh, not just in the way I showed you today, but as a general matter, modeling, client models, uh, to try to estimate hurricane risk. Not just as a matter of climate change, but even in the present climate. Because the statistics aren't enough, right? Historical statistics aren't enough to give you a good, robust risk estimate. We've got to start doing physical estimates of risk. And um, I think that's going to be a very important application of our profession in the next 20 to 50 years or so. So uh, maybe some of you will be interested. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a very uh, great delight to uh, talk to you all the last two days, and naturally I'm happy, to, if there's time, to answer questions.
Okay, so any questions? Please. Okay. I have two questions. The first one is about the you, you show some relationship between the potential intensity and CO2 yeah. increase. Yeah. And uh, I wonder uh, how CO2 increase affects the potential intensity through yes. so, SST. Um, well, I would put it this way. I would say that uh, uh, carbon dioxide affects both the sea surface temperature and the potential intensity. And the reason I make that distinction is because potential intensity is also influenced by a lot of other aspects of the climate, uh, like changing surface wind speed, for example. Um, and so, but the pure thermodynamic effect is interesting. So if you keep putting carbon dioxide, double, triple, quadruple, I mean, you really put a lot of carbon dioxide in. The ocean temperature increases indefinitely. But the potential intensity does not increase indefinitely. It goes up and then it asymptotes. And the reason why is because you get to the point where there's basically zero net infrared radiative flux at the sea surface. There's just as much radiation going out as coming in. And so evaporation is only balancing the solar flux. But the solar flux isn't changing. The evaporation isn't changing. The evaporative potential doesn't change. So if the wind speed isn't changing, the potential intensity doesn't change either. But the temperature keeps going up. This is why I think we have to try to be careful about making a one-to-one -one correspondence between ocean temperature and potential intensity. And second question about the uh, future uh, typical cycle frequency. You showed that the uh, seven uh, seem to be model and six seem five models. <coughs> different uh, different, different answers, yeah. So, do you know uh, the reason? No, well, <laughs> I wish I did, see, I wish I knew. Um, yeah, there, the CMIP 3 and the CMIP 5 gave different answers. All I can tell you is the technique we applied was basically the same in both cases. Um, the models clearly evolved, but it isn't apples to apples because we use the A1B emission yeah. scenario in one case and the RCP 8.5 in the other case. Although I've since looked at RCP 4.5 and it's quantitatively less change, but qualitatively it looks the same. There weren't the same set of models. There was an overlap. But of course, each of the models, you know, like the GFD model, CMIP 5 models, is not the same as the CMIP 3 GFD model. So, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew, but I don't know. <laughs> what it does make me is less confident in the answer. I, I have no idea what's, what, what's right. I don't think anybody else does. And no technique that's based on the downscaling of climate models can be better than the climate models, right? They're all limited by whatever the climate models limited by. So, um, so global warming signal to like we have experienced more intense tropical cycle may exist, but the uh, the signal, global warming signal may be small. <coughs> compared to the natural variability of typical cyclone density. Yeah. And keeping this in my mind, in your mind, uh, I suggest you get a bunch of questions like uh, how much this tropical cyclone is, is affected by global long warming yes. just by referring to a single tropical cyclone event. Yes. How do you respond to this kind of a question? The way I did here, I, was, I say, all we can do is say what the probability of an event like the one they're asking about is evolving in time. That's all I think you can say. I'm unwilling to say the storm was caused by climate change or X percent of the storm was caused by climate change. I don't like any of those statements personally. I think it's perfectly fair on the other hand to say that in a particular technique for assessing risk that the probability of an event like that is changing and we estimate it's changing at this rate. That's fair. But you're not saying specifically what caused that event. But let me say that, you know, it is a problem in risk. 
It's not a problem of signal detection, which is the way scientists tend to look at it. In, if you are scientifically conservative about signal detection, you put a lot of weight on the null hypothesis. But in risk assessment, to be conservative is to be the opposite. In some sense, you assume the worst. You certainly don't assume the best. And so, if you are trying to assess risk, you really want to give the people you're trying to communicate with a probability distribution of that risk, the whole probability curve of how that risk is changing. And it may include some parts in which the risk isn't changing very fast, and another part of that probability distribution is changing fast. Remembering that the consequences are strongly weighted to the high tail. That's so important, and it's so easy to forget. Right? If there's a 98% chance that if you let your daughter cross a busy highway, she'll make it without being run over, but there's a 2% chance that she'll be run over, the consequences of losing your daughter are so horrible that you're not going to let her run. Right? The consequences of it being the global climate change being on the upper end of the probability distribution are pretty horrible, okay? Consequences on the lower end are not very horrible. It's civilization. You don't let your daughter run, you know. So when we assess risk, we have to pay attention to the tail. And uh, that's hard to do based on historical statistics because it's the tail. We don't have very many events there, but they're the consequential ones. Yeah. John, one more question. So I think you work with a lot of uh, statisticians, and as we are meteorologists, as you mentioned, we like to do better job than statisticians. But how you can convince yourself, you that as a meteorologist, you are doing a better job as statisticians because we are based on physics, but uh, a lot of assumptions to estimate the risk. So how? Uh, I, I, I don't look at the question the same way you're looking at it, I have to say. It isn't a question of being better, okay? That's not it. It's a question of when you assess risk, you should throw everything at it you've got. And that means, yes, you use the historical statistics. Absolutely, you use them. But it's not enough. You can also use physics. And they each have their strengths and weaknesses. The best landscape you can do for risk is to use everything. And I, the, the problem is society is not now using everything. It's not that we're trying to beat the statisticians. We're trying to say that they're not sufficient. quasi-balanced model. So, obviously it's not the same set of equations, but in principle it's like integrating the quasi-geostrophic equations. Do it the way you integrate any. So, so you, you actually quasi-static at each step yes. the, to adjust the next environment. The next That's right. Yeah. Okay. It's basically you're solving equations that like conservation of potential intensity and temperature at the boundaries. <coughs> and then inverting that to get the secondary circuit with a sort of Sawyer or Leeson type of equation. Yeah. Uh, you are showing, show the performance looks pretty good compared with the National Hurricane Center, so I would be surprised. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I have to tell you a very quick story about that. I know we're running a little behind it. When I developed the CHIPS model, it was for a laboratory exercise for students in a course like this. Mm. Way back when, I wanted them to be able to play around with the parameters and see. And maybe the third time I um, taught the course, a student raised his hand and he said, why don't you try to, why don't you use this to forecast real hurricanes? And I laughed and I said, of course you can't use it for that, it's too simple and all of that. And then I woke up in the middle of the night and said, well, you know, maybe if we put in 
um, GFS boundary conditions that are time evolving, and we use the official track. Why not try it? It wasn't so hard. And the first time we tried it, it was so perfect. You know, it's like beginner's luck that we couldn't believe it. We thought maybe we made a mistake. <laughs> so, anyway, we started testing it, and it did it did much better than I thought it would. And um, and I don't know. I, it's actually a little bit strange. I don't understand why that's true. It is not as good as a H wharf model. It's just not as good as that. But I would have expected it to be much worse. And it's only a little bit worse. I don't know why. Thank you very much. Um, you may not remember, but I requested uh, the chips 10 years ago when I was a student. Oh, you did? And I didn't give it to you? And you kindly offered. Yeah. <laughs> and I developed a little bit later on. But anyways, um, when I uh, used the chips model, uh, sometimes the calculation failed. It oh. means, you know, the okay. numerical divergence kind of. And uh, so I think it comes from uh, kind of our, you know, they cannot find a solution. But at that time, I couldn't find the reason why. If you have similar kinds of our uh, experiences, can you? No, I haven't actually. I mean, actually, it may be that we've, you know, we've been doing this operationally since 2001, and I don't remember times when the model itself failed in the sense of stopped working. I so maybe my facts. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I mean, yeah, that's very old days, but I think I, I myself have to think about that. Thank you. <laughs> like uh, maybe hypercans regime maybe the hypercan regime will cause it to fail. But right. I hope maybe you're not integrating it in that regime. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank you very much. I'm interested in the chips model. So uh, so the, maybe the uh, the, uh, the chips model uh, 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 rainfall uh, uh, rainfall estimation. Rainfall amount estimation using the SIPS model. So at that, at that, uh, you are right. The, the rainfall, uh, uh, rainfall is, is, is expected expected to be uh, uh, estimated by the flux di uh, water vapor flux convergence. And also, uh, maybe it is very important to estimate the precipitation efficiency. So how do you calculate or how do you? Uh, uh, use the distribution of the efficiency around the. Uh, we don't. Type. I mean, it's a big weakness of it. We don't. We assign 0 0.9 precipitation Is that the efficiency. Constant to variable? Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> and I mean, the only reason I think there's any hope for it is that most of the rain is coming from the core. Yeah. And the cores of tropical cyclones are very efficient precipitators. Yes. And so we probably don't do a very good job with preferable for a lot of different reasons, among mm, which yeah, that. Yes. Let me just say very quickly that, you know, for this workshop I produced uh, these large Kyoto-based event sets for four reanalyses and actually six climate models. I only had five when I produced the slides. If anybody would like to work with those data sets, they're pretty compact. I just come and talk to me or write me, I can supply you with those data sets. If you'd like to try to do further analysis of it. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I have one about the LC coupling yeah. uh, of the chips model. So, uh, how different between uh, the LC coupling and the prescribed SSD version of the very different, very strong different. storms. It's very, very important to couple to the ocean if you want to be quantitative. Uh, weak storms don't matter much. And uh, storms moving rapidly over deep ocean mixed layers, it's not a strong effect. But on the average storm, it makes a big difference to couple. And I think one of the big sources of error in all operational forecast models is not is insufficient real-time knowledge of the thermal and density structure of the upper ocean. Um, we're not doing a good job initializing the upper ocean in these models. 
recognize there's any there or you know, a, a depth anomaly. It's it's a big deal. And it's it's one, one D model, right? Yeah, so we string a bunch of columns along the track of the cyclone. <coughs> and I had a student years ago who compared that to using a full 3D ocean model. And it was a pretty good comparison, except when storms were moving very slowly, then this approximation we we're using breaks down. But again, uh, why increase the computational cost by a factor of 100 by coupling to a 3D ocean model? But in the spirit of simplicity, we use one. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I very much impressed that you mentioned uh, storm surge uh, has a very uh, large risk as a tsunami. Uh, actually, this year is a 60 year memorial year of Typhoon Lea, which caused a uh, uh, very high storm surge and more than 5,000 people uh, were killed here in the central part of Japan. But Japanese people understand that tsunami is very, very dangerous. But you know, uh, most people understand uh, the, the danger, risk of uh, storm surge. So you showed a very impressive uh, video. So I, I think uh, it is very effective to understand it for Japanese people to understand the, the risk of some such. So I want to know uh, how do we convince the Japanese people to the risk of some such? Show them the film. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, ser seriously, I think, you know, this actually raises a really interesting thing. So you're, we're all scientists, we work on something that is actually a big human hazard. Um, some of us, I think, if you are so moved, it, it really does work, I think, to occasionally think about giving talks to the public. And I do this a fair bit, everything from church groups to towns and villages and uh, people who are just interested in, in tropical cyclones and you make them aware of what the risks are and they're usually very interested. But one person cannot do that all. But if many of us took a little time now and then to, to talk to people, general people, about our research, but also about these risks, I think that's very effective. Thank you very much. Yeah. I encourage you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. I will pick it up. So in closing this uh, morning session, yeah, I, I would like to say that yeah, thank you very much for giving uh, giving us the, your special lecture, and uh, we we could learn uh, your not only your theory and model but also your philosophy behind that. And personally, uh, I could not fo uh, follow all of the mathematics, but uh, <laughs> at least I I'm motivated motivated to uh, work on. Like uh, after I go back to home. <laughs> so uh, let's give great hands to him. Thank you very much. Okay, as I noticed uh, in morning, yeah, we will have a photo session uh, in the in the entrance of this building before going to lunch, and uh, we have a lunch break until. 120 and <laughs> it's alright. Yeah, right, right. Okay, 120 Much and then we have our afternoon uh, session of second talks. Okay. So one more announcement is our uh, Terry accepted. You know they can. Uh, they are, he agreed that you know all the uh, you know five point files and also the movie. Uh, we can open to the public, so uh, we will announce you later. Uh, you know, we will put the videos on YouTube, and uh, and I will let you know the link to the address. So uh, feel free to watch the movies, and if you you know do not understand some parts, okay. and uh, also also you know my uh, PowerPoint file and also Yamada-san's PowerPoint file also uh, will be you know open to the participants and to the public. So uh, if you are 
uh, you want to learn a uh, little bit more about uh, social science, I, I think it's a very good thing. Okay, so please go ahead to be in front of the entrance. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.